how does a normal person who lived a regular life become one of the most beastly war criminals, and a man who is synonymous with evil? He was the man who created the largest and deadliest concentration camp of the Second World War. He was the man who was personally responsible for the deaths and slaughter of over one million people. Rudolf Hess, at the end of the war, would be brought in front of a war crimes trial, and he brazenly admitted that he was responsible for the deaths inside of Auschwitz, and he would outline the deadly nature of the camp. He was a man who rose to dizzying heights inside of the SS, and was a personal and close friend of Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS. He was a man who would set up his home next door to the camp, and his wife described him as an ideal family man at home, but when he went to work, he was a man in charge of torture, execution and mass murder. This is the rise and fall of the Commandant of Auschwitz, the story of a man whose actions led him to become one of the most wanted war criminals and most notorious war criminals of World War II, but his fall would be swift at the hands of a war crimes trial that would result in him being executed inside of his own camp, being the final person to die inside of Auschwitz. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Born on the 25th of November 1901, inside of Baden-Baden, a spa town, Rudolf Franz Ferdinand Hess was raised inside of a strict Catholic household. He was the eldest of three children, and he had two sisters, and he was baptised. But little did the priest who performed this know what monster he would be baptising, and that this young child would later become the devil of Auschwitz. As a child, Hess was lonely, and he did not have too many friends, and he would later claim he experienced an incident in which he was abducted, but this is disputed. His father was an experienced military man who had been involved in the German army, and he enforced the importance of religious worship and military discipline in his son's life, but Rudolf Hess actually wanted to become a priest in his younger years, and he was set in his belief for some time. But then things would change, as he would enter service during the First World War. Hearst was, at the age of 14, admitted as part of his father's regiment, the German Army's 21st Regiment of Dragoons, and shockingly he was just 15 when he was fighting with the Ottoman Sikh Army in Iraq and the Middle East. This was incredibly young to be involved in the bloodshed and slaughter of a battlefield, but Hearst did witness the Armenian Genocide, but when he was in Turkey he gained further military promotions, and when he was 17 he earned the accolade of being the youngest non-commissioned officer in the German army. He suffered whilst he was away with malaria, and was awarded the Iron Cross, and was even given command of a cavalry unit, but when he would return back to Germany, he would ride all the way back home. But following the end of the First World War, Hearst went back to school, and he got involved in different paramilitary groups that came about following the anger of the loss of World War I. He was involved in attacks upon Polish people during uprisings, and also against French nationals, and he had deserted his career's dream of being a priest, and he was now a violent thug and a troublemaker. Rudolf Hess saw Adolf Hitler for the first time in Munich early on, witnessing a speech, and he then joined the Nazi party, and was member number 3240, and he abandoned his Catholic beliefs. But in 1923, Hess and other members of the Freikorps murdered a schoolteacher, after Martin Bormann, Hitler's future private secretary, gave the orders to do so. Hearst was arrested for this and was tried as a leader of the attack, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was released five years later, in July 1928, and he then met his wife the following year, as the pair shared the same beliefs in Germany getting back to the land, and they were both members of the Artemann League. Hearst's wife, Hedwig Hensel, was a woman who would later claim she had no idea what her husband's crimes would later be but Hearst was also rubbing shoulders with the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. He was close with Himmler, and he joined the SS in April 1934, and became a member of the Death's Head unit. These would later be in control of the concentration camps, and Hearst was sent to train as a guard at Dachau, and he then became a block leader. He was moved to different camps to serve other commandants, and he arrived at Sachsenhausen, and whilst here he was the assistant to the commandant. He was also in control of the firing squad, and would order the slaughter of a Jehovah's Witness, who was the first conscientious objector executed during World War II. Hearst was the man who gave the coup de gare gunshot to the head of August Dickman, with his pistol finishing him off, showing how ruthless a man he could really be. Following the invasion of Poland, he then joined the Waffen-SS, before he went back to work inside of the concentration camps, 
and continued to slaughter prisoners. One evening at Sachsenhausen, he forced all of the prisoners who were not in work detachments out of their blocks in almost minus 30 degree weather, and the prisoners were hardly dressed and many of the inmates froze to death. He also denied medical treatment to those who were suffering, but by this time Rudolf Hurst had proved to be a brutal and savage man who was capable of killing and carrying out the ruthless evil of the concentration camps. Because of this and his friendship with Himmler, Hurst was sent to Western Poland on a mission to evaluate a site which was being considered to become a large concentration camp capable of mass human destruction. He surveyed the site and he reported back to Himmler about the suitability of the expansion and this led to him being given the job of overseeing the creation of Auschwitz. He was also named the Commandant and this was truly Rudolf Hurst's camp. He dreamed of making a site which would display ruthless efficiency and Hurst wanted to kill as many people as he could as quickly as he could and also make the camp as profitable as possible. He vowed to do things differently and also built a villa next to the camp where he would live with his wife and five children. One of these children would even be born inside of Auschwitz. The first prisoners who were sent to Auschwitz were Soviet POWs and Polish prisoners, and these were forced to set up much of the infrastructure around the site and build many of the buildings. 700 people got there in June 1940. And they were told on their entrance that they would probably not live longer than just three months. Auschwitz at its core had three main sites and areas. Auschwitz I, the main slave labour administration site, Auschwitz II, Birkenau, the main extermination area, and Auschwitz III, Monowitz, the IG Farben factory. Each of these sites was staffed by some of the most horrific and evil guards who would prey on the weak, would execute and kill with their bare hands. They would also use weapons and encourage dogs to attack and maim. Hearst ensured his guard staff were notorious and ruthless and that they did not take any slight infringement of the camp's rules. There were also many subcamps set up that served Auschwitz, but there were areas of Auschwitz which really told of the evil intent that the Nazis, and specifically Rudolf Hearst, had. The Death Wall was an execution site at a firing range, where thousands of people were sent to, and they would be stood up against a reinforced concrete wall as a firing squad shot them dead. These people were not even registered in the camp's numbers, and Block 11 was also established, which was a torture block, where much horror was administered. Torture chambers such as the standing cells, Tiny, oubliette-style dungeons where prisoners were locked in for days could be found here, and guards would also batter and beat prisoners. Rudolf Hurst had created, in a short period, a truly harrowing camp, where there was regular execution and extermination, torture and suffering. He wanted to work out the best way of mass exterminating people, and he would experiment in different ways, and he settled on using gas inside of gas chambers, and selections took place where prisoners arrived at the camp. Those who were not fit enough to work would be sent straight to the gas chambers, and they were killed. Hearst's camp relied on deceit and lies, as his men and guards would instruct these people that they were going to be given a shower, but instead of water, poison came out of the system. Further expansion of the gassing facilities occurred as the camp grew, and thousands could be killed every single day. Rudolf Hearst would later state of this that, technically it wasn't so hard, it would not have been hard to exterminate even greater numbers. The killing itself took the least time. You could dispose of 2,000 heads in half an hour, but it was the burning that took all the time. The killing was easy. You didn't even need the guards to drive them into the chambers. They just went in expecting to take showers, and instead of water, we turned on the poison gas. The whole thing went very quickly. It was he and his deputy who introduced Cyclone B, the deadly pesticide that became the weapon that murdered millions. However, Hearst would find himself sacked as the commandant of Auschwitz, as he could not control his perversions and mannerisms. He was caught having a relationship with a prisoner of the camp who became pregnant, and was then held, shockingly, whilst pregnant, inside of a standing cell. She was forced to experience a horrific ordeal, and she had just escaped selection. But the SS found out about this, and Hearst was relieved of control but he would return in 1944 to Auschwitz in summer to oversee the deadliest killing operation carried out in the camp, which was known as Operation Hearst. In just 56 days, Rudolf Hearst managed to slaughter 430,000 Hungarian Jews, along with guards at his disposal, and his organisation led to Auschwitz not being able to cope with the sheer amount of dead. 
The guards had to abandon the gas chambers and the crematoria at times and shoot the victims and then burn them in large open fires. It was truly harrowing, and Hearst finished a Second World War working inside of the all-female camp, Ravensbrück, where he helped to construct the gas chamber there that led to more than 2,000 women being killed inside of it. At the end of the Second World War, Heinrich Himmler told Hearst, along with other close friends, to use false papers to hide and try to evade any form of capture and justice that would be served at the hands of Allied tribunals. Because of this, Hearst travelled to Gottrupel, a small town, and he lived here with his family under the name Franz Lang, and he even escaped capture for around a year. But he was a very wanted man, and his wife was captured, and she later gave over information that led to Hans Alexander, a German Jew, leading a group of soldiers who went to capture the former commandant of Auschwitz. These British soldiers were armed with a box of axe handles, ready for Hearst. Hearst was confronted by these men, and he argued that he was Franz Lang, but he was then ordered to take off his wedding ring. On close inspection, this ring was inscribed with the names Rudolf and Hedvig, his wife, and with this, Alexander's men then battered Hearst badly with their axe handles. The British leader was told that he would only have a corpse to bring back if his men were not stopped, but Hearst was beaten badly, and he even attempted at one point to consume a cyanide capsule. But the British had their man, and the Commandant of Auschwitz was now behind bars. He was taken to the Nuremberg trials, and Hearst was called as a defence witness for Ernst Kautenbrunner, and he would state in front of the world's media that, I commanded Auschwitz until the 1st of December 1943, and estimate that at least 2.5 million victims were executed and exterminated there by gassing and burning and at least another half million succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total of about 3 million dead. This figure represents about 70-80% to 80 of all persons sent to Auschwitz as prisoners, the remainder having been selected and used for slave labour in the concentration camp industries. Including amongst the executed and burned were approximately 20,000 Russian prisoners of war, who were delivered at Auschwitz in Wehrmacht transports, operated by regular Wehrmacht officers and men. The remainder of the total number of victims included around 100,000 German Jews and greater numbers of citizens, mostly Jewish, from the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Greece or other countries. We executed around 400,000 Hungarian Jews alone at Auschwitz in the summer of 1944. It was a remarkable boast that Hearst had and he spoke with a brazen admission for his work. He later revised his death toll and said that I myself never knew the total number, and I have nothing to help me arrive at an estimate. I can only remember the figures involved in the larger actions, which were repeated to me by Eichmann or his deputies. He would later state of the victims, from Upper Silesia and the general government, a quarter of a million. Germany and Fersenstadt, 100,000. Holland, 95,000. Belgium, 20,000. France, 110,000. Greece, 65,000. Hungary 400,000 and Slovakia 90,000, bringing a total of victims at Auschwitz to 1.1 million. Hearst would then finish, I can no longer remember the figures for the smaller actions, but they were insignificant by comparison with the numbers given alone. I regard a total of 2.5 million as far too high. Even Auschwitz had its limits to its destructive capabilities. Rudolf Hearst was later tried inside of Poland by the Supreme National Tribunal, and he was a man who was seen as a terrible war criminal. By this point, the crimes and nature of his work he had done inside of Auschwitz were very well known, and Hearst would complain during his imprisonment at what happened at the hands of his British captors. He said, During the first interrogation they beat me to obtain evidence. I do not know what was in the transcript or what even I said, even though I signed it, because they gave me liquor and beat me with a whip. It was too much for even me to bear. The whip was my own. By chance it had found its way into my wife's luggage. My horse had never been touched by it, much less the prisoners. Somehow one of the interrogators probably thought I'd used it to constantly whip the prisoners. After a few days I was taken to Minden on the Visa River, which was the main interrogation centre in the British zone. There they treated me even more roughly, especially the first British prosecutor who was a major. The conditions in the jail reflected the attitude of the first prosecutor. Compared to where I'd been before, imprisonment with the International Military Tribunal was like staying in a health spa. 
Rudolf Hess's trial took place from the 11th to the 29th of March 1947. A huge amount of evidence was heard, and witnesses and former prisoners of the camp testified about the place that Hearst was running. He was sentenced to death on the 2nd of April, and was to be executed inside of Auschwitz after former prisoners petitioned the judges to allow this to take place. Because of this, a specially built gallows was made inside of the former camp, and it is said on this gallows that, this is where the Camp Gestapo was located, prisoners suspected of involvement in the camp's underground resistance movement, or of preparing to escape were interrogated here. Many prisoners died as a result of being beaten or tortured. The first commandant of Auschwitz, SS Obersturmbannführer Rudolf Hess, who was tried and sentenced to death after the war by the Polish Supreme National Tribunal, was hanged here on the 16th of April 1947. Whilst he awaited his execution, Hess wrote his autobiography and returned to his beliefs and faith, and he acknowledged his crimes and he said that Himmler and Hitler had used their power to commit horrific crimes. He believed he was a cog in the extermination machine made by the Nazis, and it was said of his personality in prison that Hearst is quite matter-of-fact and apathetic, shows some belated interest in the enormity of his crimes, but gives the impression that it would never have occurred to him if someone hadn't asked him. There is too much apathy to leave any suggestion of remorse, and even the prospect of hanging does not unduly stress him. One gets a general impression of a man who is intellectually normal, but with schizoid apathy, insensitivity and a lack of empathy that could hardly be more extreme in a frank psychotic. In the days before his execution, he admitted his crimes and said of these, My conscience compels me to make the following declaration. In the solitude of my prison cell, I have come to the bitter recognition that I have sinned gravely against humanity. As Commandant of Auschwitz, I was responsible for carrying out part of the cruel plans of the Third Reich for human destruction. In so doing, I have inflicted terrible wounds on humanity. I caused unspeakable suffering for the Polish people in particular. I am to pay for this with my life. May the Lord God forgive me one day for what I have done. I ask the Polish people for forgiveness. In Polish prisons, I experienced for the first time what human kindness is. Despite all that has happened, I have experienced humane treatment, which I could never have expected, and which has deeply shamed me. May the facts which are now coming out about the horrible crimes against humanity make the repetition of such cruel acts impossible for all time. Rudolf Hess's execution was rescheduled to take place on the 16th of April 1947, and it was actually scheduled to take place days before, but there were many fears that former prisoners would lynch him en route to his former camp. When Hearst arrived at Auschwitz, he was shown into his former office and was allowed a cup of coffee to prepare himself, and he was then locked away inside of the punishment bunker for some time before the time came for his execution to take place. He was led out of the prison cells, and around 100 witnesses had been gathered, including former prisoners of Auschwitz, and he walked through his camp to the gallows which had been made by German prisoners of war. Accompanying him were Polish military policemen and guards, and also the executioner, who was wearing a black hood over his head. Underneath the gallows was a stool, and Hearst was led up the steps and placed on the stool. The noose was then tied around the gallows structure, and this was secured around Hearst's neck, as a death sentence was announced. After all the final checks were made, the executioner activated the trap door, and Hearst dropped through, and the noose tightened, and within minutes he was strangled to death and was killed, and he was the last person executed in the camp, that he oversaw with much evil. Rudolf Hess is remembered in history as one of the most evil war criminals, and he was a man who was responsible for the deaths of over one million people. Hearst brought in the gas chambers and he built the camp from the ground up, and he oversaw the most destructive and deadliest days of Auschwitz. His rise to the near top of the SS was very quick, but he would be captured at the end of the Second World War, and was then executed for his horrific crimes. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe and once again, thank you so much for watching.